In the next section here, I want to talk about managing the stiff shoulder. If you specialize in shoulders, you know that this is just a, it's a nasty thing that bothers you on a daily basis and it kind of sneaks up on you. These are my disclosures which have nothing uh, to impact this talk. And so with the stiff shoulder, adhesive capsulitis, there's uh, a couple of different versions that are going to appear in your office. In the primary setting, it's idiopathic. It sneaks up on the patient. It's usually a global inflammation of the shoulder. There's usually global loss of motion in the non-postoperative setting. Secondary adhesive capsulitis is usually people have had trauma or they've had prior surgery, and this seems to be a little more selective. I mean, it can be global. The patient can struggle through all planes, but you'll really find that their lack of motion is somewhat related to whatever the procedure was. And so in the primary standpoint, it's usually insidious. It sneaks up on the patients. They don't really realize it until one day. They realize that it's hard to get dressed. It's hard to reach that top shelf. And a lot of times, you know, they'll have, they'll have, if something falls off a shelf and they reach quickly, they get searing pain at the end range. But as long as they stay within the plane of activities of daily living, they're relatively asymptomatic. It's about a 2 to 5% in, incidence in the population it's more common in females. The, uh, the dominant age is between 40 and 60 years of age. It's often the non-dominant arm, and uh, associated factors are seen with people with diabetes, thyroid disease, autoimmune disease, and uh, also in breast cancer. And in the normal joint volume in the shoulder is about 25 millimeters, and it can fall down to 5 to 10 millimeters in a severe state. So the stages are fairly well documented. Increasing vague radiating pain that just continues to not go away and continues to get better. It's usually worse at night. It's relieved by any inflammatories. It's that end range sharp pain starts to get closer and closer. So it used to be just up here kind of bothered people, and then it's here, then it's here, and then it's you know throughout the globe. Um, basically, when you look inside the shoulder, what you see is this synovitis. It usually starts in the rotator interval first and then, then works its way around. That's why the first thing you lose is rotation with adhesive capsulitis. Usually it's reaching behind the back is the first thing you lose and then it kind of goes on. The last is forward flexion because most people can get around about 130, 140 degrees and they can arch their back and then they can wing their scapula and they can get up 160 but they're really not using their shoulder. So in stage two, which is the acute freezing stage, this is where it's just a, a very uncomfortable situation. This is acute synovitis. These patients are uncomfortable even at rest, and they are truly miserable. Um, and so they are, they're just struggling on, at daytime, nighttime. It doesn't really matter. In stage three, which is the maturation phase, you see that the capsule has really become quite thick, but it's not that hot anymore. It's really just this is kind of the residual stage you have to work your way through. Um, there's severe stiffness in most planes, and this goes on to stage four, which is the thawing stage. And in the literature, this could be one to two years. But if you really look at the results, there's about a 30% residual loss, and it's worse in, worse in diabetics. So to work these patients up, there's usually some history of minor trauma, often a little stretching injury. They, go to fall, they fall down the stairs. They grab the railing. If it's in the workplace, you see this all the time in the CNAs and in the ambulance and the EMT workers when they lose control of the stretcher and it drops down or the 300-pound patient that drops down and they get that acute stretch to the cortical um, humeral ligament. Um, with time, they start to describe night pain. It's hard to get dressed. On exam, lack of passive rotation is the first thing you'll pick up. And then finally, lack of um, passive flexion. This is, this is picked up by physical exam, so you've got to touch the patient. Active and passive range of motion are relatively equal. Of interest, the strength could be relatively normal. Now, this is important. Radiology is misdiagnostic. So in other words, when you get an MRI scan, you have to be careful. Because as was, has been shown a number of times today, you know, those scans come back with partial cuff tear, slap lesion, you know, labral tear, DJD. Well, DJD is a whole different scenario. But the labral pathology especially has nothing to do with adhesive capsulitis. So it's very important not to over-treat the radiology because the primary problem is capsulitis. And you have to really treat that first and worry about everything else later. So what do you do? Well, we've been doing what you probably everybody does here, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy concentrates on just stretching, no strengthening. If you strengthen a hot shoulder, it get, actually gets worse. Usually we'll try a Medrol dose pack early on if they're not too bad. We fairly rapidly now go to a fluoroscopic or ultrasound guided intra-articular cortisone shot. It's more accurate. If you do it in a hospital setting, if you use a radiologist or in a post-op setting, you get a diagnostic arthrogram to check the rotator cuff at the same time. And we started doing this about eight years ago. And we looked at our first 100 patients. 
And these are all fairly significantly affected people. They had already failed physical therapy. They were technically sent in for a manipulation or released under um, um, arthroscopically. So we tried doing this study, and we treated 100 in a row, 80% resolved within three months without surgery. That's really significant given the fact these people were at that point. They all, they all had the HMO, got the denial letters, they were given a little cane to stretch at home and told to take a hike. And so that's a tough situation to turn around. About 10% required a second injection, and 10% did go on to surgery, but the surgery wasn't as difficult because they had regained some of the motion on their own. Now, if you do take these folks to surgery, first thing is to try to ma manipulate forward flexion, straight up the forward flexion plane, because breaking up the inferior capsule makes life easier. It makes it easier to get into the joint, and it also takes care of the work you have to do inferiorly. And then when you do set these up, if you do it in the lateral position, uh, set them up with less abduction, because the more abducted the shoulder, the more it drives the head into the glenoid. It makes it more difficult to get in. And the, those of you who do it in the beach chair position, it actually is somewhat easier, I think, to get into a stiff position in the beach chair position, because the arm is abducted. Careful of the entry. You don't want to damage the cartilage, so you stay high and uh, irrigate out the hematoma. And the biceps may be the only landmark when you get in there, maybe the only thing you can really see. And so the first thing is uh, clean up the labrum and the biceps interval, because that's always tight. Release the superior glenohumeral ligament, and then march down. And with each step, as you march down, you're going to get better and better visualization. Here's a really thick, as you come down, middle glenohumeral ligament. I've already dissected out the subscapularis. Sometimes you can't even see it. And so you can really take that all the way down to your manipulation. And often, the manipulation has broken up everything inferiorly. In a really significant setting, you can come across the bottom. But of course, that's where the risk is. And so when you go down inferiorly, as was uh, shown, uh, Larry showed earlier when he dissected out the axillary nerve, here's the left shoulder. This is a study we did a few years ago, dissecting out the axillary nerve to see its course. So the capsule's been removed. The nerve comes up beneath the subscapularis here on the right, teres minor on the left. So it's the posterior branch to the teres minor that's actually at risk and comes as close as 12 millimeters to the glenoid at the 6 o'clock position. The main branch to the delta it goes out the quadrangular space and stays about 17 millimeters away. So you do have to be careful, stay as close to the rim as you can when you're coming down inferiorly. Postoperatively, um, well, sorry, posterior capsule, there's been a couple of reports in the literature. I used to always release it, but it didn't seem to make that much of a difference. So I don't always do that any longer. It seems that you know, most of these folks truly really an anterior inferior problem. So I'll do it if I really think it's necessary, but not always. When you go up in the subacromial space, you should go there with the idea of not, if, if at all possible, not to do a decompression because that's usually not the problem, number one. And number two, you want these people to be able to move immediately. So the more you do, the worse they do. So this is one of those situations. If you can avoid repairing something and if you can avoid doing a decompression and moving them quickly, they do better. And give them a little more of a re-manipulation at the end. Postoperatively, no sling. Encourage use in motion. Stretching is everything. Start PT early. Um, and again, it's all stretching until they get about 80% of their motion back. And then you can start some gentle strengthening. Uh, CPM, jazz splints are beneficial but not crucial. And it's still in these patients. takes about three to six months to plateau. And in the diabetic patients, as you all know, uh, it tends to recur with time. So those are the easy ones. So what about the tough ones? The stiff postoperative shoulder, um, I see a lot of this. About half my practice is redo, so it, it gets interesting to figure out what to do differently and how to make them better. And so these are secondary problems. They all come in complaining of pain and weakness. Uh, they have loss of motion, but it's not usually global. So you just have to kind of figure out where. If they're in the workplace, that's a very common saying. I just want my life back and I want to go back to work. And so post-op pain stiffness factors that we've noticed is that glenohumeral adhesions are the most common post-operative complication affecting really up to 20% of patients. It's um, seen more often with immobilization in the diabetic patients. If they're stiff preoperatively, they're going to be stiff postoperatively. There's no question about it. So move those folks early and too much done. You really have to be careful about combining label repairs decompressions and cuff repairs, because that's really a recipe for disaster. So if possible, try to avoid that. And so we looked at this a few years ago, and one group we really noted to be uh, an issue, and this has been mentioned a few times today, is slap labor repairs. And in the study group that we looked at, uh, the average age was 44. Uh, a small subset had a rotator cuff disease. Uh, some had arthritis, some had adhesive capsulitis. The clear-cut common denominator among that whole group, though, is none of them had instability. So they basically woke up with a labor repair or a slap repair they didn't expect. 
And so you've also seen earlier that anything prominent in the superior glenoid causes uh, damage on the uh, kissing lesions on the humeral head. So you have to be really careful. Bad decisions equal bad results. And so, you know, not all anchors are appropriate for the superior uh, labrum. So smaller is better if you're going to be up there. Here's another example of a 32-year-old girl who had uh, repair of her normal sublabral hole. See the kissing lesion there um, on her humeral head. And so this girl is a 32-year-old 32 32 year workout queen who hadn't brought her arm above 90 degrees for a year when I saw her. And so we've cleaned her up, but she, you know, even now, still struggles because of the discomfort from the shoulder. And then you saw this uh, picture earlier. Uh, this, is, this is an indicated surgery. This is a 23-year-old who had a pulling lesion, and they did a nice job in the slap repair, but they get this bulbous deformity on the superior labrum, which causes pinching. And um, just the breeding that actually gives them a fairly good result. But you can think about what happens in the throwing athletes is that if you have that looking labrum, uh, labrum that looks like that, what happens in the late cocking phase when they get to this position, the cuff hits that and causes that sharp pain. And that's often why they fail. And so labral repairs, again, in 52-year-old pipe fitters who have never dislocated their shoulder, there's not really a good indication to do this. And you can see he's got, th he's got three anchors right in the middle of his head. These are peak anchors. You can see they have superb holding power. There you go. And so um, if you're going to use, use anchors, again, use them in the appropriate position and for the appropriate reason. Subacromial stiffness. Now, this is really interesting. So I would say this is a common denominator among post-operative stiff patients, and you don't really pick it up that easily because the MRI may be totally normal, maybe a little fluid in the subacromial space. But when you get in there, that's what it looks like. And what happens is they scar their cuff repair or the decompression to the acromion. And usually it's people who bleed early and don't move because the blood sets up like almost a gel or a glue. The other place you see this now is that a lot of us use um, pillow braces after big cuff repairs. And if the patient doesn't move and spends six weeks sitting like this, the cuff heals to the acromion. And I've done a number of releases uh, where I've actually had to just peel the cuff. It's healed to the head as well, but it's healed to the acromion, and the patient moves the whole head and the scapula together, so it tethers their motion. One guy had actually ossified the uh, attachment of the uh, acromion to the, uh, to, the, um, to the cuff. So if you're going to use a pillow brace, just make sure the patient's doing some passive range of motion the whole time they're in, the, in that brace, and that'll, I think, prevent that from happening. And so when you're looking at this, again, look at the, the operative report. Um, focus on the true pain points and listen to the patient. You know, it's really look at passive range of motion versus act and try to really concentrate on what you're going to have to release when you get there. On x-rays, you want to see where the hardware is. I use metal anchors in the head when I do rotator cuff repairs because if they come out, I really do want to know where they are. Um, it helps to get a, an idea of what the prior decompression looks like and to see if there's any issues with the, uh, if there's a fracture or AC joint pathology. Treatment options. Intraarticular cortisone shots under x-ray guidance. Again, we use that in, these, in this setting, and we do an arthrogram at the same time to see if the cuff is intact. Uh, it does give us information. In the work comp population, uh, putting a lot of lidocaine in there just to see what happens with that is a good test. Does it take away their pain? Do they get a week or two of relief? And even then, if, they, if the pain comes back and they're still stiff, at least gives you an, an indication that they're for real. And so when you're in the joint, uh, at arthroscopy, you want to debride out all the foreign material that you can. This is a guy, a uh, 50 year old architect, who dislocated his shoulder on his first surgery. He had a bank cart and a slap repair, but they didn't fix his rotator cuff. I guess they didn't think that was that important. And so then um, he failed on the second surgery. You can see his biceps is pretty beat up. So we TND stem, took out the foreign material, and fixed his rotator cuff, and he eventually did fine. And so when you're in there on these shoulders, it's really a selective release of adhesions. If they've had a slap repair, usually it's the middle and superior glenoidal ligaments will be just captured. If they had an anchor in the sublabral hole, they lack external rotation, almost none. Yet they can usually forward flex, they can usually get behind their back. So these are fairly easy. Just by releasing that, these folks can do quite well. Up in the cerebrocomial space, entry can be tough. So as you come in, stay right on the acromion and peel back and forth, and you can get the scar tissue off the acromion. And usually all you have to do is recreate that space. Just release all this scar tissue so that the, the uh, rotator cuff can slide underneath the acromion as it's supposed to. And if you need to do some residual work on the decompression, that's fine. I usually do this, um, the bone is usually thin, so you have to be careful about fracture. And I always do this with the burr on reverse. It almost polishes the tissue rather than digs into it. So try that. It gives you a little more tactile feel as well. And anything prominent from the prior repair you want to take out. 
And so just to finish up, here's a revision. This is a, a lady who had a mini open, believe it or not, double row repair. Uh, pay, the uh, dock had been working out a little bit, and so the anchor was a little bit too far in. And so this is what it looked at, like at the time of um, surgery. So it was sticking out, but it was at the 6 o'clock position, which made it uh, somewhat difficult to get to. The other problem with that design of that anchor is you can't pull it out. So fortunately, what we were able to do is kind of just push it back beneath the um, surface of the um, of the inferior aspect of the humeral head. And so that worked, and then we fixed her, fixed her cuff. And so she went on to do quite well, but um, that was kind of an interesting uh, result. And she's actually, she's a piano teacher. She's back doing um, everything. So in summary, the least invasive approach in an angry shoulder is the better. Sometimes I'll hear, well, it didn't work well arthroscopically, now we're gonna open it up. It's actually, that's not the right thing to do. You, the one good thing these patients have is a deltoid, so you don't wanna screw around with that. Avoid treating the MRI report. The MRI report in a post-operative case is just full of unnecessary pathology. Even the cuff is difficult to determine what's intact, what's not, and so you have to be really careful. Think about what you're gonna do when you get in there. Less is often better. The shoulder is very unforgiving, and motion is everything in these shoulders. Thank you very much.